friends, and welcome back. I'm Matt Steinfeld, the director of the Watson Institute. And of course, this is Ambassador Chaz Freeman, who today will be delivering the, the final lecture in his three-part series. Just to refresh your memory, uh, Chaz, in um, lecture one, discussed diplomacy as strategy. And in, in fact, across all, both of the, the, the lectures uh, previously and the lecture today, Chaz um, argues that diplomacy is um, the use of a type of power, primarily through words and, 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 and negotiation, but power to get uh, counterparts, some friends, some adversaries, to accept changes in the environment, the international environment, that they may not have been naturally inclined to accept, but through diplomacy they do accept ultimately and accept in ways that serve the interests of the, of, of, of the country that the diplomat is representing. In the first lecture, Chaz described and discussed diplomacy as strategy, so another strategy, a plan of action for achieving a desired end with the most efficient use of resources possible. And I think, Chaz, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but your argument in the broadest sense was that diplomacy for the United States is ultimately about securing an international environment that fosters the achievement of the most important domestic aims, which is the pursuit of life and liberty and happiness at home. Um, and in the course of that first lecture in, on strategy, you discuss the importance of understanding the nature of an adversary, understanding what category of, of counterpart one's dealing with, and not simply enemy or ally, but many gradations in between. More, moreover, understanding the um, multidimensional nature of the game that one is in, in uh, diplomatic interactions, and perhaps uh, to me, what was most striking in that discussion of strategy, understanding the importance of being able to redirect a discourse, often by changing the question that's being asked or changing the question that's being presented to the counterpart, and the fundamentally important strategic um, turns that have been made historically, by, partly by the United States, but also by other countries, through this process of restructuring the question that's being addressed. In the second lecture, Diplomacy is Tactics, uh, Chaz presented the idea that not, that diplomacy isn't just about strategy in the grandest sense, but diplomacy is, is art and it's skill and it's a certain ability under a variety of circumstances to contemplate what the next step may be in any kind of situation and to contemplate what the first step should be before adversaries and counterparts really understand what those first steps are and examples include decisions and processes about preparing for a war before one's engaged in a war, preparing in ways that prevent adversaries from becoming full enemies or that deprive adversaries of the ability to form alliances, a preparation before the war for understanding how to terminate the war, preparation during the course of terminating the war for ensuring that after the war peace and stability are maintained, preparation or carrying out of a variety of economic strategies that may be more subtle than simply sanctions and that may be more effective than simply sanctions. Uh, the process of carrying out tactically or through art processes of, ne of negotiations, ones in which you understand what your counterpart, whether it's a friend or an adversary, how your, how your counterpart sees the world. What are the particular lenses that he or she is using and therefore what are the leverage points you might have over that adversary or counterpart to get him or her to do what he or she would naturally be inclined to do, but that you want that counterpart to do. And today in this lecture, uh, Chaz turns to diplomacy as risk management, which it, my understanding involves the prevention of bad things happening and often the prevention of things, prevention in ways that outside observers may not recognize you're even doing something but in the, your own quiet ways, you're creating environment, back to the first overall strategic discussion, creating an environment in which at home you can pursue life and liberty and happiness without being distracted by conflict overseas or high transaction, high transaction costs overseas, which move your attention to places where they shouldn't really be, which is at home. Chaz, let me turn it over to you. I'm eagerly awaiting part three. Well, thank you. Oops. Obviously, um, Ed did understand what I was um, saying, and I'm grateful for that. Um, 
Uh, there are actually four lectures for those who are interested. Uh, the first one was not here, but at Harvard and MIT. Um, and they're all going to be on my website if you're interested in reading the set. Um, and I'll just start right into this, uh, which is not about change, as Ed said, so much as it is about maintenance of existing affairs. Uh, at the basic level, diplomacy is the management of foreign relations to reduce risk to the nation while promoting its interests abroad. In this task, diplomacy's success is measured more by what it precludes than by what it achieves. And one can never prove that what didn't happen would have happened if one had not done this or that. But for the most part in foreign affairs, the fewer the surprises and the less the stress, the better. The ideal outcome of diplomacy is the assurance of a life for the nation that is as tranquil and boring as residents in the suburbs. And like suburban life in its day-to-day -day manifestation, diplomacy involves harvesting flowers when they bloom and fruits when they ripen while laboring to keep the house presentable, the weeds down, the vermin under control, and predators and vagrants off the property. If one neglects these tasks, one is criticized by those closest, regarded as fair prey by those at greater remove, and not taken seriously by much of anybody. Viewed this way, the fundamental purpose of US foreign policy is the maintenance of a peaceful international environment that leaves Americans free to enjoy the prosperity, justice, and civil liberties that enable our pursuit of happiness. This agenda is what motivated the multilateral systems of governance that the United States created and relied upon after World War II, the so-called Pax Americana. Secretary of Defense Mattis, who is a thoughtful fellow with whom I don't always agree, uh, said, uh, called the Pax Americana, quote, the greatest gift of the greatest nation, unquote. Institutions like the United Nations, its specialized agencies like the International Monetary Fund, the World Health Organization, and related organizations like the World Trade Organization sought to regulate specific aspects of international behavior manage the global commons, provide frameworks for the re resolution of international disputes, and organize collective responses to problems. In the aggregate, these offspring of US diplomacy established and sustained widely accepted norms of behavior for many decades. International law drew on consensus to express these norms as rules. To the extent they were accepted internationally, these rules constrained state actions that could damage the common interests of the society of nations the rules had brought into being. Despite its uneven performance, the Pax Americana assured a relatively high degree of predictability in world affairs that facilitated peaceful international interactions. It did so on the same philosophical basis as the rule of law in domestic affairs, a belief that rules matter and that process legitimizes outcomes rather than the other way around. Today, that philosophy and its ethical foundations are under attack both at home and abroad. For the time being, at least, Washington has set aside the rule-bound international order and the market-driven economic interactions it enabled. The United States is discarding the multilateral strategic framework that it built to restrain the behavior of lesser states in the last half of the 20th century. In its place, the Trump administration is experimenting with neo-mercantilist theories where it seemed to have been crowdsourced to right-wing talk radio. Washington seeks to maximize U.S. leverage over trading partners by dealing with them only on a bilateral basis. Trade and investment are increasingly government managed and hence politicized rather than freely contracted between private buyers and sellers. So far, it must be said, such bird-brained bilateralism 
is proving no substitute for the complex regulatory regimes it is replacing and the supply chains it is disrupting. With the fading of previously agreed rules of conduct, codes of conduct, and the principle of pacta sunt servanda, which means agreements must be kept, what could, could once be taken for granted in managing relations with other states must now be repetitiously renegotiated and reaffirmed bilaterally. But Washington has demoted diplomacy as a tool of American statecraft in favor of primary reliance on military and economic coercion. Escalating uncertainties are driving nations toward unrestrained unilateralism and disregard for international law. As this century began, the United States popularized contemptible practices like the assassination and abduction for questioning under torture of foreign opponents. A lengthening list of other countries, China, North Korea, Russia, and Turkey, to name a few, have now brazenly followed this example. Bad example. But more issues are being deferred as intractable, addressed ad hoc, or dealt with through the threat or use of force. In this new world order, or disorder, more accurately, the need for diplomacy to tend fraying relationships is manifestly greater than ever. The Congress and the public, as well as the US military, sense this. They have resisted efforts by the Trump administration to slash budgets for peaceful international engagement by the US Department of State and related agencies. Still, the American diplomatic imagination has not been so myopic and enervated since before World War II. Nor have US investments in diplomacy Americans' expectations of their diplomats or international trust in the United States been so low. Diplomatic preparedness requires constant attention to other nations and their views, showing that one's government is interested in and understands what others think encourages them to be more receptive to one's own ideas. Attentiveness to their needs, views, and doubts signals willingness to work together and cultivates willingness to cooperate in defending common interests. The regular nurturing and reaffirmation of relationships is what makes it possible to call on a network of friends in times of need, responding politely and considerately in the least offensive way one can to others' messages conveys respect as well as substance. It invites their sympathetic study of the logic, intent, and interests behind one's own messages. Constant diplomatic inter intercourse promotes stability and predictability. It inhibits inimical change, reducing the risk that amicable states will become adversaries or that adversaries will become enemies. And it provides situational awareness that reduces surprise and enables governments to respond intelligently and tactfully to trends and events. All this may seem obvious, but it takes a sustained commitment by national leaders, public servants, and well-trained diplomats, as well as reliable funding to carry it off. In the contemporary United States, none of these is now assured. The safety net provided by routine diplomacy, as I've just described it, is increasingly neglected. The resulting disarray in American international relationships is shaking our alliances, eroding cooperation with our international partners, raising doubts about US credibility and reliability, causing client states to seek new patrons, and diminishing deference to US national interests by friends and foes alike. Increases in military spending demonstrate eagerness to enhance warfighting capabilities but greater capacity to wreak havoc does nothing to rectify the doubts of foreign nations about American wisdom, reliability, and rapport in our conduct of relations with them. U.S. military power is as yet without effective challenge, except at the regional level. But on its own, it is proving consistently incapable of producing outcomes that favor our national security. 
It is a truism that those who cannot live by their brawn or their wallets must live by their wits. Neither war nor the threat of war can restore America's lost political primacy. Only an upgrade in American confidence at formulating and implementing domestic and foreign policies, coupled with effective diplomacy in support of credible American leadership, can do that. In recent years, Americans have become better known for our promiscuous use of force and our cynical disregard of international law than for our rectitude and aspirations for moral excellence. U.S. foreign policy has featured unprovoked invasions and armed attacks on foreign countries, violations of their sovereignty through drone warfare and aid to insurgents on their territories, assassinations and kidnappings, interrogation through torture, the extrajudicial execution of citizens as well as foreigners, universal electronic eavesdropping, Islamophobia, the suspension of aid to refugees, xenophobic immigration policies, and withdrawal from previously agreed frameworks for collective action on matters of global concern like climate change. This sociopathic record inspires only the enemies of the United States. It is not a platform that wins friends, influences people in our favor, or encourages them to view us as reliable. Foreign perceptions of American society have also deteriorated. Many now see the United States as having evolved a transparently venal government of the people by the plutocracy for the plutocracy. They are very aware of the inequality of opportunity, unequal to income distribution, and other injustices that now negate the soaring promises of our Declaration of Independence. They are dismayed by the gun massacres in our schools and other public places, and the police gun downs of black Americans, as well as the denial and hypocrisy that our politicians and media habitually display in response to such events. They know that America's claims to be a free society are mocked by a prison population that is the highest per capita in the world, at least five times higher than that in notoriously undemocratic countries like China. They are sickened by reports of the bloated costs, gross inefficiencies, labor immobilities, lack of insurance for the poor, and high rates of maternal and infant mortality that result from the uniquely dysfunctional American public health system. And they are not favorably impressed by the partisan political gridlock, fiscal follies, or private affluence and public squalor of contemporary America. They are put off by a society that no longer distinguishes fame from celebrity or notoriety, and that and they are appalled by the smug provincialism of the celebrity-strewn American establishment. Foreigners once admired American exceptionalism for its aspirations to moral excellence. Now it is a byword for self-righteous complacency, thoughtless rejection of global norms of social justice, and unilateral announcements of policy that have not been preceded by consultation with presumed partners. Leadership without followers is a non sequitur, no pun intended. Non-democratic models of governance are currently outperforming ours in a number of ways. To challenge them, Americans need to recognize our deficiencies, address them, up our performance, and return to managing risks to our enjoyment of freedom and prosperity by carrying out the elementary chores of routine diplomacy. Only this can restore the foreign respect for our system of government and its leadership that has been the foundation of our international influence. Some diplomatic chores yield immediate gains. Others are long-term investments in garnering goodwill and building rapport, laying down strata of what I call fossil friendship that can be mined in the future or keeping warm memories of past cooperation suggestively alive. 
as current events demonstrate, when these chores are not done, the nation loses in both the short and the long term. As an example of diplomatic work that generates near-term results, consider the help diplomats make available to businesses seeking to export their goods and services. Trade promotion is sometimes described as corporate welfare by ideologues, but the support to commerce that diplomats offer can be essential to ease access to foreign markets for American companies and to enable them to deal effectively with foreign laws and regulations. Export promotion is in the national interest as well as that of the companies and their employees who earn a living from exports. Part of any embassy's mission is to help American businesses do due diligence on potential customers and partners and to introduce them to foreign officials and local, local business elites who can facilitate trade and investment. American ambassadors who have been properly trained to represent the United States see themselves as the chief U.S. trade promotion officers in the countries to which they are accredited. They and the officers from the Departments of Agriculture, Commerce, Defense, State, and Treasury, whom they lead, do what they can do to encourage their hosts to buy American. This, the exports that this work sustains, that this work, the exports that this work supports, sustain 10 and a half million American jobs. Diplomats are also central to the facilitation of international travel. Diplomats specializing in consular work issue passports and visas, help citizens who get in trouble abroad, and facilitate educational exchanges. They thus enable travel in both directions for, ed uh, for education and tourism, as well as trade and investment. There are now almost 1.1 million foreign students in the United States. The tuition they pay funds more than 450,000 jobs in the U.S. educational establishment and contributes just short of $37 billion to the U.S. economy. Meanwhile, foreign visitors spend about $170 billion annually on travel services in the United States, helping to support a domestic travel and tourism industry that directly employs over 5 million Americans and indirectly generates an, another 8 million or so jobs. And while they're visiting, foreigners buy another $80 billion or so in goods and services. Less tangibly and less visibly to the public, diplomatic interactions are a major element in government awareness of foreign thinking, planning, and actions that affect both national and particular interests in the United States. Reporting and analysis by U.S. diplomats overseas typically provide a substantial majority of the material that intelligence agency personnel charged with all source analysis you rely upon to brief policymakers in Washington, if they agree to be briefed, I guess we have to add these days. There is no substitute for ground truth, artfully captured and examined in light of U.S. interests in making sufficient sense of foreign countries and cultures to enable officials to respond intelligently to these. Sadly, even the best diplomatic and other reporting cannot compel Washington policymakers to accept inconvenient foreign realities that conflict with their political prejudices and delusions. As the American statesman Chester Crocker has remarked, quote, surprise is what usually follows the collision of intelligence with an entrenched policy consensus, unquote. <laughs> From time to time, such surprises happen, and Washington decision makers seek to avoid blame for their errors of omission by finding scapegoats, as the fate of the so-called old China hands, among others, illustrates. The declining role of diplomats in U.S. foreign relations and our increasing reliance on the U.S. military foreshadow future surprises from foreigners we haven't bothered to understand. If one relies on overthrowing foreign governments rather than on dealing with them nonviolently, there's no need to bother understanding them or their motives for taking the positions they do. A diplomatic presence adds value only, the extent, only to the extent that it enables face-to-face -face communication 
with the local authorities and their constituents. The cultivation of contacts in the host country is the key to collecting information relevant to statecraft, otherwise known as intelligence. It is also the most effective means of accurately and persuasively conveying one's government's views to the host government. But the global metastasis of anti-American terrorism that has led, the, has led the United States to fear local contact and to build embassies that are heavily fortified and inaccessible to all but their employees. The growing isolation of our diplomats impairs, even if it does not entirely eliminate, interaction with local officials and populations. It obstructs direct insights into the motivations driving popular opposition to America and makes the U.S. government dependent on information from other governments, some of which is bound to be self-interestedly manipulative. Cowering behind blast walls sends a message of fearfulness that bolsters terrorist confidence in their ability to intimidate the United States and reduce its influence abroad. It turns embassies into attractive nuisances. It makes it easier for those seeking to in isolate the United States abroad to do so. The principal ben beneficiaries of the cover your ass mentality that drives embassy fortification and isolation are government contracted security specialists, architects, and construction companies, not the diplomats they've been tasked to protect. According to both ancient tradition and international law, the protection of ambassadors and their entourages is the responsibility of host governments. Embassies should not be reconfigured to serve as centers of imperial administration. The turn to resident diplomatic representation representatives uh, that took place in the 16th century was not motivated by a desire to establish armed enclaves or citadels of extraterritorial power in foreign capitals, but to aid routine communication between sovereign states. Fortifying diplomatic missions and arming them against attacks by the local citizenry implicitly relieves host governments from their responsibilities to keep ambassadors and their entourages safe from harm. It helps them to evade domestic political responsibility for defending the embassies of unpopular foreign states from mobs. It may, in fact, incentivize governments to look the other way as protesters assault heavily fortified embassy installations. The United States needs to reconsider policies that generate terrorism against it. But Americans should also be prepared to withdraw embassies from countries that cannot keep them safe. In most cases, there's nothing to gain by condoning the failure of such countries to meet international standards for the maintenance of diplomatic relations and shielding them from the consequences of their irresponsibility. The physical security of diplomats is important, but information security is truly vital to their work. Honest discourse on sensitive matters requires reliable assurances of confidentiality, whether it is to lawyers' clients, physicians' patients, or diplomats' interlocutors. In democracies, the people have a right to know what policies their government is following and why. They have no legitimate interest in the sources and methods by which their government is gaining information from foreigners or influencing their decisions. Analysis should be disclosed, but the details of diplomatic conversations and reporting on the views of foreign governments and individuals must be privileged. Breaches of professional privilege degrade the candor and reduce the effectiveness of exchanges of information. Diplomacy consists of professionally privileged exchanges. The indiscriminate release by WikiLeaks of classified cables reporting confidential exchanges between diplomats and their foreign sources seriously degraded U.S. diplomatic intelligence collection, intelligence collection capabilities. 
The inclusion in the WikiLeaks release of diplomatic evaluations of foreign leaders' character and political performance titillated and impressed the public with the notably high quality of American diplomatic reporting and analysis. But it did grave damage to U.S. relations with a number of countries, ruined productive relationships with key sources of information, resulted in the expulsion of some American diplomats, and embittered previously cooperative foreign leaders against the United States and the official Americans with whom they had been meeting. Fears of, for, of future leaks have caused American diplomats to report less honestly and fully to Washington than before. The same concerns about information security compounded by self-centered amateurs playing at diplomacy with an eye on politics back home have led to meetings with no note takers or the bowdlerizing of the records of American officials' meetings with foreign officials. Nobody has gained from the corruption of diplomatic record keeping by American officials, except perhaps the foreign competitors of the United States. Unlike us, they have not corrupted their institutional memories and are armed with accurate accounts of their interactions with American leaders. When future disputes arise over what was or wasn't said in meetings, they will have the advantage. And by the way, what did we tell Mr. Gorbachev about NATO expansion? The focus of diplomacy is the ruling authorities, those with the power to make decisions for their, their polities. But all political systems defer to public opinion to one extent or another. Democratic governments are subject to popular supervision through elections. The democratization of politics in Europe a century or more ago led to widening recognition of the importance of public diplomacy. It also widened the interaction of legislators with foreigners. Technology then allowed them to travel abroad, allegedly on public business, uh, but often for personal enjoyment. Not to worry. Exposure to reality, realities outside the Beltway bubble improves minds. Foreign deference to American power and support from American embassies have long assured VIP treatment and high-level access for our representatives by foreign officials. But congressional travel abroad creates ill will when, as is all too often the case, members of the House and Senate offer no welcome in Washington to the very foreign officials who had pampered them on their own trips abroad. As foreign deference to the United States continues to ebb, Congress really needs to consider how to reciprocate foreign hospitality to its members and staff. The United States would be strengthened were Congress critters to make a serious effort to improve their own poor reputation abroad. As US officials, they too have a responsibility to contribute to US public diplomacy. Public diplomacy is, of course, the patriotic art of making one's country appear to have the better cause. But it is, and it is designed to explain policies and institutions in terms that are persuasive to audiences in foreign cultures. During the Cold War, this was the task of the United States Information Agency, or USIA. Created in 1953, it was euthanized in 1999 when the Clinton administration determined that history had ended, CNN was on the job, and new private sector outlets like Fox News were about to ensure fair and balanced American coverage of notable events. Unfortunately, the extension of these media to foreign audiences has lowered the reputation of the United States abroad by directly expo exposing foreigners to the global yokelism of American celebrities and the ethnocentric prejudices of American popular culture. USI's functions were severely downsized, then transferred to the Department of State, which has little or no credibility at home, still less abroad. There is now no significant corrective for the spillover to foreign audiences of our partisan media's politically motivated distortions of American policies and realities. 
presidential tweets have just exacerbated this problem. With relative U.S. influence in, in, on foreign elites in decline, a future more orderly administration will almost certainly want to restore the capacity of the United States to disseminate reliable information on U.S. policy and to introduce the higher elements of American culture to audiences overseas. The Secretary of State's probably the right cabinet officer to oversee this function, but the Department of State may not be the right place to house it. A, foreign, a future administration will also want to reconsider the utility of foreign aid, the transfer to other countries of official capital, goods, or services as a tool of U.S. foreign policy. Originally conceived to promote economic development, build markets, and modernize economic governance in Europe's colonies overseas, foreign assistance programs entered a new stage with the Marshall Plan. From 1948 through 1951, the United States transferred some $13 billion, about $150 billion in today's dollars, mostly in the form of grants, to 17 Western and Southern European countries. The program succeeded in helping them to restore industrial and agricultural production, establish financial stability, and expand trade. In the Cold War, the United States used foreign aid as a diplomatic tool to fo foster political alliances and secure strategic advantages, withholding or withdrawing aid from those states uh, which seemed too close to the Soviet Union. Washington leveraged multilateral programs like those of the World Bank and regional development banks, building on the donations of other wealthy capitalist nations to spread Western economic norms to developing economies. But development specialists were increasingly marginalized as aid was bent to the service of military interventions and other political projects. U.S. foreign assistance peaked during the Vietnam War. Since the end of the Cold War, U.S. foreign aid has been used to fund pacification and anti-narcotics programs, as well as to support long-term development, subsidize client states, counter pandemics, provide disaster relief, and underwrite foreign military modernization programs. Over time, the proportions spent on these functions have shifted. Only 7%, 7%, now goes to bilateral programs aimed at long-term economic development. Global health programs get about 24 percent, a good investment given the threat of pandemics. Israel and those Arab neighbors who've made peace with it get 20 percent of the whole. Somewhat over 17 percent goes to foreign militaries and 13 percent to stabilizing countries where the U.S. armed forces are engaged in combat. As the civilian aid budget has shrunk, the armed forces have drawn on the defense budget to fund their own foreign assistance programs. Military disbursements aside, annual U.S. expenditures on foreign aid now come to about $150 per American, or less than two-thirds of 1 percent, actually 0.17 percent of GDP. Per capita, the United States ranks 20th amongst donors in the 28-member OECD. The ranks of U.S. experts on development policy program implementation and the facilitation of socioeconomic change uh, abroad are rapidly thinning out. In practice, despite the size of the U.S. economy, Washington no longer plays the leading international role in economic development activities. Lessening investment in foreign assistance is not without adverse consequences for American influence. As one example, China's Belt and Road Initiative is encouraging infrastructure construction and the harmonization of trade and investment regimes throughout the entire Eurasian supercontinent. Unless Americans find a way to make ourselves relevant to uh, complementary or competing projects in that space, we will be without influence in a huge geoeconomic zone that is central to the global economy of the future. At present, our government no, no, no longer has either the institutional capacity 
or the funds to respond to this or similar challenges. Abraham Lincoln asked, notably, do I not destroy my enemies when I make them my friends? Diplomacy is about the cultivation and exploitation of friendship with foreign states and peoples. There is a pertinent Arab saying that, quote, a friend who does not help you is no better than an enemy who does you no harm, unquote. <laughs> friendship rests on empathy and its demonstration in supportive behavior. As our military commanders have discovered, quite aside from cooperation in building physical and, and uh, industrial institutional infrastructure, a little walking around money helps to win friends and influence people. In diplomacy, including the parliamentary diplomacy of international organizations like the United Nations, the spontaneous return of a favor, a ration of flattery, a gesture of respect, an apparently sincere offer to consult, a reassuring glance, a respectful retort, a comforting silence, and reliable follow-up to implied as well as explicit undertakings can be worth a lot. Vote trading and mutual backscratching cement habits of cooperation at the UN. The same is true in alliance management, a key diplomatic skill at which Americans once excelled. Diplomacy is relationship management as contact sport. Its conduct depends on the talents and training of the men and women who engage in it. Diplomats learn to see transactions as part of a process that defines relationships. Every negotiation of a specific issue contributes to judgments of character and elements of trust that affect future interactions. Sharp practices earn long-term distaste. The wisest diplomats cultivate a reputation for integrity, fairness, and determination to follow through on commitments, demonstrating that their government will back them in delivering the, on the commitments they make is as important as reaching agreement on the business at hand. Doing so raises the probability of productive future interactions with foreign counterparts. It also helps prevent disputes from solidifying into impasse and irremediable hostility. So does the maintenance of good relations with adversaries at the negotiating table, keeping issues in a state of negotiability rather than accepting deadlock is a key precept of sound diplomacy. Optimism is to dip diplomats what courage is to soldiers. Language is the principal weaponry of diplomacy. Interpreters are foot soldiers, but language is more than words and syntax. The body often speaks before the mouth, and even when the mouth is silent. Body language, too, differs across cultures. The widespread use of English as a lingua franca has not obviated the need for diplomats to learn foreign languages and how to communicate effectively with their native speakers, nor will the perfection of machine translation do so. Mastery of a language in all its dimensions is a path to the avoidance of the kinds of misunderstandings and miscalculations that give rise to conflict. It's essential to understand how the native speakers of the language think. That is the sine qua non of transnational communication and cooperation. Ability to think in the language of one's foreign counterparts is also the antidote to the classic sin of home-based analyst, anal analysts and their political masters. The tendency to view one's foreign partners and competitors as mirror images of oneself. It is a grave mistake to project one's own values and thought processes onto foreigners rather than considering their perspectives and proclivities in their own terms. Many instructions for diplomatic demarches written in the political hothouse of the capital are composed as much or more for the domestic policy community as for the ambassadors who must execute them in the field. But the delivery of demarches is ultimately a personal and oral, not an institution 
institutional or written art. Early on, ambassadors learned to focus on the results these instructions aim to produce, rather than on the suggestions on how to produce their arguments that accompany them. Diplomatic instructions are more often than not written by diplomatically inexperienced courtiers and securocrats who are seldom aware of locally prevalent prejudices and sensitivities or who are inclined to be dismissive of those. But it's the outcome, not the original packaging of the message, that counts, however appealing the packaging may be to folks back home. One of the reasons for staffing the State Department and other foreign affairs agencies in Washington in part with diplomats, foreign service rather than civil service, home-based officers, is to ensure that foreign policy objectives and instructions to the field on what must be done to advance them are realistic and feasible. Sometimes, however, political pandering and bureaucratic brown-nosing of powerful policymakers overwhelm experience and expertise. In the course of my own 30 years as a diplomat, I was asked to arrange many things overseas that the local context made obviously counterproductive. Fortunately, I'd been born with a sense of the absurd and a gift of laughter. I have al almost always had fun trying to arrange the ridiculous things I was asked to arrange, even if, as is usually the case, I failed. I very seldom question an instruction, no matter how bizarre. Occasionally, I actually succeeded in bringing off some bizarre maneuver conceived within the beltway, notwithstanding how preposterous it was. But there is one instance that illustrates the gap between Washington and foreign realities so well that I cannot refrain from sharing it. During the 1990 to 91 Gulf War, I was ambassador to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, an austere Islamist state whose ferocious anti-communism had precluded diplomatic relations with the USSR. As the war progressed, a constantly expanding circle of American bureaucrats discovered that the Saudis had a lot of money. Actually, the war had stripped them of their wealth, but no one in Washington was prepared to believe this. As rumors that the Saudis might be a soft touch spread, requests for their largesse multiplied, becoming more and more outlandish as they did. In January, February 1991, the Soviet Union was in dire straits with serious food shortages. The Cold War had ended, and the United States had quite sensibly judged that it was important to help. Next door in Poland, there was a surplus of ham. Some bright fellow somewhere in Washington noticed this and brought it to the attention of the Deputy Secretary of State, an august official for whom I had high personal regard. The next thing I knew, I received a personal request from the Deputy Secretary to go ask the Saudi king, who as a Muslim abhorred pork in any form, <laughs> to buy up the Polish ham surplus and give it to the star starving Soviet communists for whom he had even less use than ham. <laughs> I pondered this imaginative proposal overnight. <laughs> the next morning, I told my boss in Washington that asking the king to buy ham for Russian communists would be like asking the pope to buy rubbers for the Bangladeshis. <laughs> and I would not do it. The man never forgave me for that. But diplomats cannot be doormats. They are meant to exercise judgment in the interests of the nation. Until recently, diplomacy has operated within an aut autonomic ecology. These are not normal times, however. The web of diplomatic interactions that stabilize the global and regional state systems has been disrupted. The institutional memory that permanent diplomatic establishments provide is evaporating in the United States as politically connected amateurs replace professionals in pivotal positions, and diplomats are excluded from meetings with foreign leaders and the sec between the foreign leaders and the Secretary of State and other senior envoys. Contractors are replacing government employees in key functions. No one seems to know what the policy is. 
still less what it will be tomorrow. The lack of purposive diplomacy on the part of the United States leaves openings for its many rivals for regional domination. U.S. influence is rapidly being displaced. Travel to the United States by students, tourists, and business people is in rapid decline. Americans have embarked on a trade war that is likely to hurt our economy as much or more than those we have decided to combat. The United States is ceding ground to its rivals who are prepared to invest the time, effort, and money to fill the international power vacuums that our erratic behavior and withdrawal from diplomatic engagement are helping to create. All this awaits correction at a future date. In the meantime, the United States can expect continuing slippage in its prestige and influence overseas. We Americans can and should use this period of diplomatic fecklessness to prepare to recruit, train, and deploy a new generation of diplomats. The next generation will face greater challenges than those who are now leaving the government for greener, greener and more remunerative pastures. They must be more competent and professional than their predecessors if we are to regain the ground we are now losing. In the three lectures that I now conclude, I've sought to explore the basis for a body of diplomatic doctrine that has yet to be compiled. As a nation, we've become over-dependent on our armed forces to defend our interests abroad. I believe that, event that events will eventually compel our elected leaders in Congress and the White House to search for alternative instruments of statecraft with which to advance our national interests beyond our borders. Our diplomatic preparedness, readiness, and capabilities have atrophied to our accumulating detriment. For our country to prosper in freedom, we must fix this. There is a need for a new breed of American diplomats to meet the challenges of a new and more demanding world order. In my view, interdisciplinary institutions like the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs have not just an opportunity but a duty to help develop the knowledge and methodology the United States will need to train and develop men and women to manage and implement our nation's foreign relations. Our country has a history that makes me optimistic that where there is a need, Americans can find a way to meet it. But as the effort I've had to put into these lectures has reminded me, using the past to prepare for the future is hard work. It's in the national interest that that work be done. If not here, then somewhere else and soon. Thank you. Chaz, th thank you so much for that lecture and for, for all of the, the lectures in the series. Uh, maybe I'll lead off with the first question. I, I'm not sure I, I can really articulate this as a question, but I'll, I'll try. Uh, so at least in my understanding over the last three sessions, the one quality that at least jumps to my mind is decadence, that you've described a U.S. that's decadent, that just decay and, and, and decline. And I guess my question is, decay or decline from what exactly? I mean, one, one interpretation is that there was a, a kind of a golden age of multilateralism after the end of the Second World War and extended across the Cold War. But, but you were much more sophisticated than that, I would say. And, uh, you know, you pointed to the, the, the problem that in the Cold War, the, the it, Cold War wasn't easy, but it, it at least led to a pretty straightforward um, effort to contain the Soviet Union and a kind of a trench warfare style of diplomacy that it wasn't for lack of imagination. That was just the, the, the geopolitical circumstances of the time. And I think your point was that that's not really relevant anymore to the, to the present. And even if we felt that that was a, a golden age to some extent, I think most of us would acknowledge there were a lot of screw-ups then and, you know, Messrs. Allende and and uh, GM and, and uh, most of the decade, you know, ma many people would, would point to 
screw-ups of various kinds, and those, those happen. So it doesn't seem that there's really a golden age we could point to as, a, as an, a model for the future. And if we turn to the future, I'm not sure that diplomats are the ones that you're suggesting should provide the answer. To put it differently, it sounds like you're asking for a, a much different and much more creative way to think geostrategically. And that's about a, maybe a foreign policy elite, but it's about more than, it may include diplomats, but it's about more than diplomats. It's about leadership and about the way the public and elites think about the world and think about geopolicy. And I think you've been very fair in criticizing the Clinton administration, the George W. Bush administration, the Obama administration, and now the Trump administration in failing to be creative in, its, in, in their respective um, geostrategic thinking. And I, I guess that leads to the third piece of this question, which is to say if it, if it isn't diplomats exclusively who are going to come up with this geopolitical thinking, what really is the point then of focusing on training better diplomats? I mean, what is the role of the diplomat in this process mm -hmm. of coming up with a more effective and creative way to think about the world? Very complex and very relevant um, question. Um, you, uh, you began by ec um, echoing Clemenceau. I don't know if you were aware that you were. I was not, but I'll, ta I'll take it. He, he, he said the United States of America is the only, after encountering Woodrow Wilson, he said the United States of America is the only country that proceeded directly from barbarism to decadence without undergoing a period of civilization, <laughs> um, which was a little unkind, I think. Um, um, I think the broad answer is um, uh, that uh, a diplomat can be no more effective than the leadership in the society that he or she represents. Uh, so the ultimate answer is um, action by citizens, their leaders, raising civil, civic literacy about diplomacy and the issues that I've been discussing. Because this really is a realm in which I'm convinced uh, we can find uh, historical examples that provide suggestive responses uh, to problems. There are very few problems that in the course of the last 4,000 years of recorded history have not occurred somewhere. And um, the, as to why um, we are having the grave difficulties we are um, uh, coming to grips with change in the world, and I agree, there was no golden age. Um, we came into the world as a major actor with no experience. We did what amateurs do. We learned on the job. Uh, we had a brilliant beginning, actually, with uh, the creation of key institutions after World War II. But we fumbled a lot as we went uh, forward. Uh, and there are things we can learn from those fumbles. But the context then, as I've said, in not today, but in previous lectures, was very different from the one we now confront. There were rules. The world was divided into two blocks. Diplomacy's function was to hold the line. It was the equivalent of trench warfare. You didn't want to let the other guy pass into your sphere. Occasionally, you'd send a patrol out into his and hope it came back. Um, but basically, you were, in, you were conducting positional warfare. There are no rules now, or fewer. The rules are, being, are going away, not, by the way, being torn down by China or even Russia, but by us. Um, even though we accuse others of destroying what we call the rule-bound liberal order, uh, we are the principal instruments of destruction. The rules are going away. Um, there is no organization of the world into competing blocks. If there is an ideological competition, it is a subset of a competition for deliver, delivering goods and services, government performance. Uh, China, for example, has no ideology that it can explain, let alone export. But it is trying to demonstrate an example 
that will inspire people to look to it and derive their own conclusions about how to do things. That is something that the United States historically attempted to do too. Uh, we didn't go abroad imposing, for the most part, imposing our way of life on people. Uh, we tried to demonstrate a good society at home and hope that people would be inspired by that uh, to follow us. Um, so the statecraft of the Cold War is very different from the statecraft that is required in the New Age. But we went through a period which uh, Charles Krauthammer um, called uh, the unilateral moment, um, unipolar moment, after the end of the Cold War, when we believed we were omnipotent and having proven the superiority of our system in our view, that we were also omniscient and that we were invulnerable. No one would dare attack us or even resist us because of our strength. And then 9-11 happened and it was a terrible shock and I think we overreacted terribly to it. Um, I, I think of uh, the Brits who went through 80 years of IRA bombings uh, without sacrificing very much of their civil liberties. They did sacrifice some and they certainly were not kind to the Irish. But um, we threw out a lot of what we were allegedly trying to protect after 9-11. Um, so um, the answer is lack of preparedness phase change, lack of adaption, ad ad adaptability or adaptation to the new, the new circumstances, and singularly bad leadership in a society in which, as I mentioned, fame and notoriety are not distinguished. A um, semi-retired uh, prostitute uh, has the same weight in our news cycle as the President of the United States. Maybe she gets that because she's smarter and has her act together more than, <laughs> than her opponent, but that is neither here nor there. The moral equivalencies uh, are really uh, amazing. Uh, we used to have exercise judgments that we now refrain from doing. And we revere a celebrity and we elect people to high office precisely for the reason that they are celebrities uh, despite the fact they have no relevant experience. So when uh, John, Donald J. Flip-Flop Trump uh, began to um, show that he wasn't up to the job, uh, there was a movement to draft Oprah Winfrey, um, <laughs> whose qualifications in some ways are considerable, uh, but the President of the United States is the world's largest management job and I don't, aside from her membership in the ranks of plutocrats, um, I don't see what was that was about. Um, so we have a combination of uh, ignorance of our own history, of the nature of international relations, um, inertia, we have a huge establishment that has vested interests in continuing to do everything the same way. Um, I'm urging everybody in this room to watch Korea uh, in that regard because as I suspected, it's the South-North interaction, not the U.S.-North Korean interaction that is the most pregnant with change. And um, uh, I just, urge you to watch that space. I might be wrong. Um, but um, in any event, we need to prepare ourselves to deal with a world in which we can no longer snap our fingers and people will jump too. Uh, we need to work at influence abroad. And in order to do that, we need to figure out what we want to do. We have to stop starting wars and then asking generals to tell us what they're about after the fact. Um, and uh, doing what George W. Bush did. When are we gonna end the war in Iraq? When the generals tell me we can. 
Whatever happened to civilian control and leadership? Uh, anyway, uh, we have a severely, you used the word decadent, I would say degenerate, um, political system. Uh, it needs fixing. And it, it isn't going to get fixed by anybody but us, people in this room and others who are worried about it have the capacity in our society to change things. We have to do it. Thank you. You asked a complex answer. I gave you a turgid and incomprehensible <laughs> answer. Thank you. Questions? Do you want to field them, Chaz, or do you want me to? Uh, it's okay. You can go ahead. Yeah, the question over here. Um, well, nothing has changed for many years. Um, um, I treasure a fragment of an editorial from the 1857 New York Herald Tribune uh, for which Karl Marx wrote, um, but he did not write this editorial. Uh, in it, talking about the nomination of somebody to go abroad as ambassador, the newspaper said, diplomacy is the cesspool into which flows the scum and refuse of the political puddle. <laughs> um, a man not fit to keep at home is just the one to send abroad. Um, so there's been a fair consistency in our approach to this issue over the centuries. Um, and for a long time, it didn't matter. It didn't matter much uh, for the first century since uh, essentially we were on our own behind our two oceans. It didn't matter that much in the second half of the 20th century because we were all powerful, if not all wise. And we had a huge margin for error. It does matter now. Um, but I would say generally, um, this is only a part of a larger problem, which is the disparagement of expertise in our society. Um, if, if expertise is denounced, and faith-based analysis and politically convenient narratives replace it, you get bad decisions and poor performance. Um, so uh, the spoiled system um, is a ridiculous way to, to uh, staff a government. Um, and we are the only society that now does that. Actually, recently we haven't even been nominating uh, people with thick wallets and thick heads as we normally do, I, um, but we have been nominating anybody. We have uh, only th three of the top ten positions in the Department of State are currently held by anybody, and two of those are acting, and one's about to retire. So I think um, we need to get serious. Um, and the reason we need to get serious is that foreign affairs are no longer trivial. Um, they are, we are involved in a world, we still have the advantages of geography, which I've talked about before, I won't, I won't quote Bismarck this time. Um, but uh, we need to, uh, we need to do better. And it does start with the appointment of personnel. Anybody who's d done management, this poor fellow, for example, <laughs> um, will tell you that 60% of it is personnel selection and nurturing, mentoring. How on earth can someone who's never done a job and doesn't even really know what it is mentor the people who are working for her or him? Uh, they can't. Um, so this guarantees, and this is the importance to me of doctrine. doctrine uh, contains the accumulated lessons of a profession. Uh, and it is amended and emended as it goes forward and experience is recorded in it. Um, but if everybody's an amateur, there's no doctrine. Um, so, 
So here we have one sort of very nice example. Apparently, well, depends on the time of day, I guess. Uh, we might be going back into GPP, we think. The fact that nobody out there wants us to come back <laughs> on the terms that we think we should is a problem. And as I said the other day, we are going to increasingly find ourselves um, on the outside looking in and trying to uh, recover the positions that we've voluntarily <coughs> given up. Questions in, all the way in the back? Well, that, that of course is the sad thing, that uh, we have Tweedledee and Tweedledum in terms of two parties that are not focused on government performance, uh, but on um, something else, whatever it is, personal, personal aggrandizement, uh, wealth, influence, power, uh, waiting for the revolving door to get out to K Street and strike it rich advancing some objective that is peculiar rather than at the national level. Um, our system, the Constitution is written with a separation of powers, which in many respects is now violated, but the separation of powers is real between the legislature and the executive, and the only way our system can work is for people to compromise to bargain, to do deals, to reach accommodations. Our politicians are now behaving like po politicians in a parliamentary system where winner takes all. <coughs> what the minority party does is of no consequence whatsoever to policy except in terms of its prospects in the next election. So you can have a totally irresponsible opposition and you still have a you still have a government that makes decisions and things go forward um, because the executive and the, and the legislature are merged. Um, if we are going to go on this way, we're going to have to seriously consider um, the adoption of a parliamentary system. Um, horrors. You know, that's what we supposedly, well, it wasn't really such a system in, um, in the 1780s when we became independent. Uh, it evolved later. Uh, but um, if we go on ignoring the Constitution and playing partisan politics with everything and treating um, majority as winner take all and ignore the minority, no compromise, and we elect people precisely because they pledge they will not compromise, uh, then, you know, you get what you ask for. I don't know what the answer is. I mean, there, this, this is a, now a deeply rooted disease of our political system. Maybe Aristotle was right about democracies, uh, you know, basically uh, in the end evolving into uh, autocratic, autocratic government because they fail. Well, we have no role in Syria at all, except in the military sense, where you know we are present entirely illegally in Syria. It's a sovereign country. No one authorized us to be there. We've been bombing it without any color of legal justification. Uh, if this bombing raid was, in fact, to enforce an international legal norm against the use of chemical uh, weapons, uh, that still does not justify our unilateral action. Um, so 
let's just begin with the statement that, or the recognition that we and Britain and France who joined us in this are completely isolated internationally on the legal issues. Uh, what happened uh, at Duma is totally unclear. Um, there are now competing narratives circul circulating around. Uh, Robert Fisk, the first journalist, works for the Independent in London, to get into the place uh, just today reported that he had arrived at the building where the asphyxiations occurred. Um, there was pretty much nobody there, but some eventually some guy came wandering out and he accosted him and this fellow said, oh yes, there were, my family died, they were in the basement and uh, they couldn't breathe and uh, definitely was something. And um, he had earlier encountered a doctor who treat the one that treated the old people who said it wasn't chemicals, it was hypoxia as a result of a combination of dust, uh, uh, a um, sandstorm and some other things going on. Um, people were down below in areas with no air circulation. Um, so now we have two different accounts. So the fellow who wandered out of the building then tells Fisk, oh, and by the way, the Islamist uh, Jaysh al-Islam did it. So we don't know this was this guy, you know, put up to saying that by the government or is this the truth? Um, what did happen? Um, so this brings us to the other point that for some reason we thought it appropriate to attack Syria the day before the investigators could arrive to answer those questions, um, which is odd to say the least. Third, um, I have to say that there have been three very convenient instances of chemical use in Syria. The first, if you recall, was when UN inspectors had just arrived in Damascus and were there to almost witness directly an alleged chemical attack by the government. And this provoked President Obama into asking Congress for authority to bomb Syria, um, which was denied. Um, so the question is, why would the government of Syria want to, in, because they knew the response would be an American attack, why would they want to stimulate that? Why would they wait until UN inspectors turn up to pull a chemical attack? That's the first one. The second one, which was last year, um, came in a place where the Islamists were on the run and losing. And just as the government forces were about to do them in, there was another chemical attack, which saw the United States intervene on, on the side of the Islamists against the government. Duma is in the process, it's in a mop-up stage. It's essentially now been pacified by the government. Why, as that was happening, would the government do something that would certainly result in a foreign attack on it. Uh, it doesn't make sense. So there's something missing here, um, and I guess I'd sum up the whole thing. And by the way, the attack didn't do anything to anybody, and we deliberately told the Russians, and who told the Syrians what we were gonna do so there would be nobody killed. Um, and um, so it hasn't changed the course of the war, uh, it just blew up some facilities. So we have, a, we have a situation in which fake news uh, has led to bogus um, retaliation um, against uh, unknown, uh, perpetrators who, whose guilt has not been established. Uh, that's about as confused a policy uh, arrangement as you just think about it. Fake news bogus retaliation, perpetrators unknown. Um, so it, this is not our most impressive hour. And to use the term mission accomplished, 
um, right before May 1. Um, I'm going up on Capitol Hill May 1 with uh, Colonel Larry Wilkerson to celebrate the 15th anniversary of the declaration that the fighting Rumsfeld, fighting is over in Afghanistan. And Bush, combat operations have ended and democracy is in sight in Iraq. Um, uh, you would think we would try to learn from that sort of thing, but evidently not. So I, I don't know how to answer your question because I have no idea what happened and what we did hasn't accomplished anything and it's rather hard to make sense of it. And I don't trust the Russians or Assad or the Islamists or frankly, our own people. Just, just a quick follow-up on that, Chess. The, fir the first part of your answer was about the, the international rules, which is, I think, a, a reasonable answer, but that's, I guess, a, a lawyer's perspective. Or, and one focusing on norms of, of international Yeah, either norms. there are rules or there aren't. Yeah. So, so we're behaving as though there aren't. Right, the rules, reasonable. Second part of the response was about the facts, <laughs> reasonable, which I partly is about intelligence and understanding what's happening on the ground. But what I didn't hear was a, some kind of geostrategic take on wh what does being in Syria mean over the long run, or what does absenting oneself from Syria mean over the long run in the grander scheme of the Mideast and the Shuni well, Sunni Shia split? And yeah. Now, that is a, it's a very good question. And what being in Syria has meant uh, uh, has, uh, has been to re-empower the Russians as the principal diplomatic actor in the Middle East, uh, since they have played this cleverly and we have not. Um, you, we, have, we followed a policy under President Obama of simultaneously opposing the regime and its enemies, both. Um, so anytime the Islamists would make ground against the regime, we would bomb the Islamists. Every time the government would make, take, make ground against the Islamists, we'd bomb the government. Uh, we spent billions of dollars training people. I could have told, in fact I did, uh, now that I think of it, based on, it, if you read Machiavelli, he has a wonderful section on why you should never rely on exiles. Um, who tell you what you want, that you want to hear and who have their own agendas when they go home. And uh, we've had many examples of this. Um, and you know, basically what we did was we, we found the Syrian opposition in the various bars and cafes of uh, the great capitals of the world. We rounded them up, we beat their teaspoons into swords <laughs> and we sent them <laughs> over the border. And, uh, and you know, in pretty short order, they turned over the teaspoons and the guns and everything else to whoever it was that captured them. So billions of dollars in training, no combat force produced. Why? No strategy, no purpose. And, and I think, frankly, the worst thing about the wars we're engaged in is that they don't have a purpose. So that basically invalidates the sacrifices of the men and women in the treasure that we're lavishing on these misadventures, according to the Watson Institute uh, project on the cost of war. We are now involved in combat in 76 countries. You go back to 2013, it was two, I think. So if Rumsfeld is right and the measure of success is whether you're creating more terrorists than you're killing, that's what we're doing. We're creating more terrorists than we're killing. And there will be a day of reckoning over Syria. There, there are 600,000 dead Syrians. And to attribute that to the government is nonsense. There was a war. We were both on the side of the government and against it. And the people that we supported, whether they were the government or the opposition killed a lot of people. And I think the, the, we cannot escape responsibility for that. But apparently we are. Uh, President Trump just canceled the, our contribution to reconstruction. 
in Syria. And we're not taking refugees, even though we created 11 million displaced people, 4 million of them abroad. So, uh, you know, these are illustrations of a, a pattern of behavior uh, that is self-destructive in terms of the regard of others for us, and I think for our, our self-regard, which is pretty important. Time for one last question, yeah. Well, that whole, that whole vote on that whole scene on Saturday uh, was even more kabuki than the attack. Um, it was intended uh, to curry favor with an American constituency, the somewhat embarrassed British constituency. Um, the British representative uh, actually tried to tie um, the intervention in Syria uh, to uh, the concept of uh, the responsibility to protect, uh, which of course has been rejected by other members of the Security Council, so it has no standing. Um, so no, it was all theater. Um, the reason for bypassing the cognizant organization was that we wanted political results not factual results. Uh, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, that is uh, a, a legitimate purpose of calling meetings um, or acting in them. Um, but it is totally unresponsive to the underlying question of what you do to prevent the proliferation and use of chemical weapons. Evidently, that's not, a, not an objective of ours anymore. Uh, so I can't give you a better answer than that. Well, Chaz, let me thank you for a, a wonderful lecture today, and even more important, a wonderful series of three lectures. As always, you have expanded our thinking. Uh, I, as I said a few sessions ago, you haven't left me and probably most of us with uh, renewed optimism, <laughs> but certainly with uh, renewed thinking about really troubling and, and uh, challenging times. Thank you, and please join us outside for a reception. Okay. Thank you very much.